Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am Krista McNamara, Editorial Director with Motor Age and P10 Magazines. So GDI has been around for a while, but it can still be a technology shrouded in mystery. So in today's webinar, we have with us Jason Gobrenis, Snap-on's National Trainer for Diagnostics. He's going to cover the subject of gasoline direct injection system design and operation, as well as component operation and testing. And we'll finish the session with an opportunity for you to ask some questions. So Jason, let's get started. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for that intro. Uh, if you do have any questions throughout, uh, just look at the top or the bottom of your screen, wherever your Zoom controls are, you should see a button that says Q&A. Just click on that Q&A button. Uh, it'll pop up a new window. You can type in your question, hit submit, and I'll get to those at the end of the session. I have Helen in the background helping me out moderate the questions. So uh, if you do have any questions, we will uh, we'll, we'll try and get you an answer as best we can. Uh, so as Krista said, my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's National Diagnostic Technical Trainers. I've been in the training department here for the last eight years or so, traveling around North America, helping Texan shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. And before that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep with Snap-on. Uh, so I had about 30 different Snap-on franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they serviced in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. Then before that, it was eight years at Subaru. So I worked in a dealership as a Subaru technician, and I guess over time became that diagnostic guy in the shop. Always ended up with the drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would show up on those cars. And that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth, was trying to figure out all those weird head scratcher type cars that would come into my bay. And before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching jobs, been a little over 25 years underhood experience for me. So as we said, tonight's topic is gasoline direct injection. We're going to go through an overview and also talk about how we will test some of the components and pieces parts when it comes to the gasoline direct injection system. So first off, you might be wondering, well, why in the first place uh, do we even have GDI? Why, why, why do the manufacturers go to gasoline direct injection? Well, it does offer some benefits. Uh, first and foremost, increased fuel economy. And a lot of that has to do with we're using a lot less fuel per injection. Uh, so every time we inject the fuel, we don't have to use as much in order to get the same performance or actually a little bit better performance as we go. It does increase the power with a smaller displacement there. So we know uh, the manufacturers have been going to the smaller engines as well. So it helps increase the power in those smaller displacement engines. Also due to the lower charge, it lowers the vehicle CO2 emissions too, which is you know greenhouse gases. And that's, that's a big no-no nowadays. So we wanna make sure we lower emissions and improved vehicle responsiveness. They can tailor the vehicle's uh, response, torque curve, throttle response, based on how they and how much of the fuel that they inject uh, with the system. So let's compare this to what we might know more about from before. So multi-port injection. Right, if you think about up until the last few years ago, I mean, GDI hasn't been around that long. It's been probably a little less than a decade uh, in, in mainstream anyways, but we've had multi-port injection for a very long time. Uh, so if we're used to that, so low pressure, Typically it's a 40 to 60 PSI. Sometimes it can be a little higher, uh, but by and large, it's gonna be in that 40 to 60 PSI range for a normal idle pressure. Uh, and it's injected in the intake, right? We have multiple ports, one in each intake runner, and that's how the fuel is injected. And also the voltage that they run at, it's about 12 to 14 volts, whatever system voltage is for that particular vehicle. So I'd consider that a low voltage for that injector. Compare it, however, to GDI, and we have high pressure, anywhere from 100 to 3,000 PSI you can see on these systems. So it's much, much higher. So it's able to atomize the fuel much better and also can cut through uh, the way it's injected. It can cut through the compression that it has to cut through sometimes. Uh, it's also injected into the cylinder, as we said. So instead of through the runners, it gets directed, inject, injected directly. Boy, I'm telling you. Directed, injectly, injected directly into the cylinder, there we go, got that. <laughs> so there are high voltage injectors as well that can be over 200 volts DC when it comes to operating voltage. So we do need to be careful, high pressures, high voltage, those can both be dangerous things and in combination that can be a really dangerous thing. So we wanna make sure that we are being careful when working on these systems, relieving fuel pressure and uh, maybe wearing some special equipment, gloves and the like when we're testing voltages on here. Uh, so let's look, go, go over a system overview of how it's laid out. This is kind of a generalized way the systems, uh, every manufacturer is a little bit different. They might have uh, different components 
in different places, but by and large, it's going to be pretty much like this. We have a fuel pump in the fuel tank, just as we have with any of our other fuel injection systems. We have the fuel pump in the tank, goes out low pressure, could be a little bit higher than you're used to. I've seen some systems are a little over 100 PSI for the low side. Uh, so it could be a little bit higher than we're used to. Then it comes into the system and then we have this high pressure pump that runs off the camshaft. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, uh, but that compresses the fuel, increases the pressure going through. We have some check valves and then it goes into the direct injectors into the cylinder directly. All right, so uh, high pressure fuel using that mechanical is a mechanical high pressure pump in there. So those are the main components we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about the fuel pumps, we're gonna talk about the high pressure fuel pumps and we'll talk about the injectors and how they work and how we're gonna test them. So there's a couple of different ways to distribute fuel in a gasoline direct injected system. Uh, so one is a homogeneous charge and the other one's a stratified charge. So on a homogeneous charge, it is an evenly mixed air fuel uh, charge. So the fuel is injected at the beginning of the intake stroke. So just as that piston's starting to come down, starting to pull the air in through the intake, it'll inject the fuel into the cylinder so it can mix more evenly as that air comes in and the fuel's kind of in the middle. So it's able to uh, mix homogeneously. So slight efficiency increase with this method, also a power increase over traditional multi-port fuel injection. It allows it to mix a little bit better. Then there's a stratified charge. So on a stratified charge that has more fuel near the spark plug and less fuel the further away we go from the spark plug. They call that stratification as it gets leaner and leaner the further away it goes. In this case also, the fuel is injected at the end of the compression stroke. So on the way up with the piston, right before that spark fires, it's gonna shoot the, the fuel right at, pretty much right at the spark plug, and then it will uh, have its explosion there. So less fuel can be injected per event because of this. We'd have far less mixing of the air, and uh, the fuel can be a lot more precisely metered that way. It can also vary the fuel charge to change the torque output. So they make it a little leaner, a little richer, depending on how, it, how it's mixed, stratified, uh, that can change the torque output, torque profile of the vehicle. So there's a couple of different modes we can use to inject them as well. So we have uh, those two different types of injection, and then we also have two different modes of injection. There's really three, but there's only the one of them is only used on one engine, and it's kind of an outlier, so we're not gonna talk about it here. Uh, but we have a wall guided and a spray guided. So the wall guided, uh, the injector is far away from the spark plug, or at least further away from the spark plug than right next to it. And the fuel is injected into a cavity in the piston. So this is an example on a Ford EcoBoost. And we can see this dish in the piston there. So the, the injector is designed to spray into the kind of the divot of that ditch right there. And then due to that, it'll splash off and get distributed throughout the charge just by spraying into that. So it kind of sprays and bounces. It's like putting a spoon under a under a faucet, right? So it kind of goes everywhere. Same type of idea here. This is your spoon and the uh, injector is the faucet, right? So now that's a wall guided charge. And then we have the spray guided charge. So in this case, the way that the injector is pointed uh, and the way that the spray is guided, it goes right towards the spark plug. We can see how they're right next to each other right here. So it is injected right before ignition, really close to the spark plug. This would be more of that stratified charge we talked about earlier, where it's injected on the compression stroke right before ignition. So if you wanna see a visual between these two, we have the homogeneous operation, which is over here. So as the intake valve opens and the pistons coming down, bringing in that air, it'll inject the charge in there and it will swirl and mix. Otherwise the stratified charge with compression stroke goes up. And then as you can see, it's injected just before as the uh, both valves are closed, just before that spark happens. Now, due to system design, due to the way it works, we can have issues. And I think if, if you've worked on any of these types of engines before, you probably know where I'm going with this. Uh, but one of the biggest issues, because of how it's laid out with the injector in the cylinder, so we can see that injector from before, right? There's my fuel injector right down right in the middle. And then there's my spark plug a little bit off to the side, pretty much right in the middle. And then my valves are, well, they're around it. All right, I got two intake valves and two exhaust valves and generally the spark plug is in the middle and now my injector is in the middle too. So I am not cleaning the back of my valves at that point. So a standard port injection, as we said before, sprays into the port in the uh, intake runner and it sprays the back of the valve and it's able to clean off the back of that valve as it's functioning. 
if we're spraying it directly into the cylinder, in this case, that's wall guided too, we can see it's spraying into the piston, um, not gonna be cleaning off the back of those valves. So as a consequence of that, we can have carbon buildup. Now, where does this carbon come from? Well, if we think about the way the breather and the PCV system works on a car, yeah, we still have those. Uh, what is involved in that air that is going through the breather system and through the PCV system, it's gonna be air mixed with oil vapor, right? Because you have the oil going through the, the crankcase and such and the valve, valve covers and all that. And it gets mixed in and then it gets ingested into the intake to be reburned. That's how they process it and burn it. But if I'm not cleaning off the back of the valves, that's where it all goes, it sticks to the valves. And those valves can get pretty hot. So in that case, it can stick quite a bit to the back of the valves. Now, that, these are some pretty, pretty severe cases right here. We got a lot, if, if we had a lot sticking to the back of the valve where the seat is, it's not gonna seal properly. If we get enough of a buildup on the neck there, then it's not gonna close all the way maybe, and we have compression issues, all sorts of drivability problems. Now, some manufacturers have come up with solutions to minimize this. I don't think there's anything perfect, but at least we can minimize this. So I know for one, as I said, I work for Subaru. So I know what Subaru did is they came up, they have a patent on a reed valve that goes in the breather. So there's two breathers on the car because it's horizontally opposed. And when that air comes out, that little reed valve, not much tension on this reed valve either, by the way, it's just, just a little light valve. As it's there, as that air goes by, it sweeps the oil out of the air or some of the oil, I'm sure it doesn't get all of it, but a lot of the oil out of the air. So the oil then goes back into the, into the uh, valve cover and then the air is much cleaner going into the engine. Now, like I said, it probably doesn't mitigate everything, but it mitigates a good deal of it enough where, well, they still have problems, but not nearly as much uh, as without it. Then there's Toyota. Toyota came out with a system they called their D4S engine system. So in this case, they use both high pressure direct injection and lower pressure port injection. So we can see that cross section of the cylinder here, we have our high pressure right here and we have our low pressure right here. Uh, so that low pressure sprays onto the back of the valve and then it would be able to go in there and be injected as well as that efficiency of the direct injector there as well. So uh, that's just one solution. I think that one probably works pretty well. Uh, I haven't really torn any of them apart, but I would imagine that works pretty well because it's doing what it used to do and spray the back of the valve, right? So let's talk GDI components, right? So we talked about how the system works and how we're going to inject it and the different types of and, and ways we can do this. Now let's talk about the components. We'll start all the way back at the fuel tank. So we'll start with a fuel pump and we'll do the conventional fuel pump. And we'll also talk about the brushless fuel pumps here in a minute. So conventional fuel pump, these have been around for quite some time. And this is a basic direct current motor, right? So it has a stator, which is the case, and it has magnets, permanent magnets on the outside of the case. And then we have this rotor in the middle with coils around it, the windings of coils. And then we have these commutators, which connect to the coils. And then we have these brushes, which ride on those commutators. This is what allows that center section to spin while also still being able to get electricity to flow through it. And what happens when electricity throws, flows through a copper conductor, we get an electromagnet. So it turns into an electromagnet and it repels itself around these two outer magnets. And that's how it's able to spin. So the voltage will go in one terminal. Let's say this is the in and this is out. So voltage will go in and you see you have a contact with this one, which goes through this coil and it goes out from this coil and it goes back down out through this brush. Now we'll see this commutator uh, se segment also is hooked up this winding, but it has nothing on the other end. So it's not making a contact. So only this one's active at this time. And then as it spins over, this one becomes active and then this one becomes active and so on and so forth as it spins. And that's what allows it to spin. So this gives you a little bit better visual. We got an animation over here. We can see those commutator segments and the two brushes and then the rotor coil spin. So in this typical brushed DC motor, these brushed fuel pumps, they provide the voltage to those coils, which starts our electromagnet process and it allows those coils to spin and the magnets in the stator stay stationary. We use this in the pump. So it's just a part of the pump. It's a big part of the pump, but it's what turns the pump. So we see the brushes at the top commutator segments, armature, and then there's my magnets on the side and that spins around. So that's your electric motor element we're just talking about. 
and that is used to spin the actual pump itself. So depending on how that pump set up to be a vein pump or, or a geared pump, uh, but that will that, that is what pumps the fuel. Comes through the strainer, goes in through the pump. We have a pressure relief valve and in case it gets too much pressure, it's able to bleed back into the tank. And then it goes through the system and then goes out through the outlet port. Also internally to the pump is an anti-drain back valve. That's pretty important too. So after, when there's no longer pressure pushing that open, say when the pump stops, the valve closes, which allows the fuel to not drain back into the tank. So we don't have to fill up all the fuel lines again next time we go to start the car. So that's very important. So if you have a starting issue, sometimes it could be a failed anti-drain back valve inside, inside the pump, right? Could be a possibility. So it's, since this is a brushed DC motor, there is a test that we can do on this that allows us to see the condition of the pump without having to remove the pump from the vehicle. We can actually check it electrically, check the current flowing. It's called the fuel pump current ramp test. Now, if you have a snap-on tool with guided component test in it, so that would be anything with a scope, so a Varus, a uh, Verdict, a uh, Vantage, a uh, Triton, a Modus, a Zeus, any of those tools have a scope in them, and those also have the guided component test function in there. So if you pull up a vehicle, you should be able to go into the fuel system, pull up the fuel pump and see this test. You don't have to memorize everything I'm gonna say right now, but otherwise, you know, if you don't have a snap-on scope, that's fine too. You can still use it. You just need a low amp probe and a scope in order to do this. So what you'll do is you'll take your low amps probe, put it around a wire anywhere in that fuel pump circuit. So if you can get close to the pump, you put it on the wire there, a jumper for the fuse. So if it has a fuel pump fuse, you pull the fuse out, put a little jumper in there, put it around that. Or the same thing with a relay, pull the relay out, put a jumper in, put it around that. What we're going to watch is the current flowing through those commutator segments we talked about earlier. So each commutator is hooked to a wire, uh, one of those coils. So in this case, we have eight commutators there. Most automotive brushed fuel pumps have eight commutators in the motor. Uh, some of the newer ones have 10, but by and large, 90 something percent of the time, you're gonna find an eight commutator segment motor. And that's good to remember. So we'll talk more about why that's important in a second. And then we see a worn set of commutators. So in this case, the brushes were uh, perpendicular to these so other times they'd be on the sides. Uh, but in that case, pretty well worn out. What we wanna see is something like this. Each one of those bumps represents one of those commutator segments spinning around and going past the brushes in the motor. Uh, so we can see we have that up and down kind of cyclical motion going up and down like waves. We wanna make sure the bumps are rounded and there aren't any missing, at least fairly rounded. In this case, this car had about 79,000 miles on it, and we can see it had a little bit of a shark fin going on there. So it is starting to show a little bit of wear, not too bad. Uh, this same car now I know has 163,000 and the pump's still going strong. So I wouldn't be too concerned about how this one looks. Uh, you wanna make sure there aren't any missing though. So let's just use our imagination quick. In the instance that, well, maybe let's just say this one right here, this one was missing, flat, gone, zero amps. This one over here, flat, gone, missing. That's the same one. That would indicate one bad commutator segment. In that case, it would be worn out, cracked, broken, something wrong with the windings. In that case, that could cause an intermittent no start. Why would it cause an intermittent no start? So if you think about it spinning and spinning, and then the motor stops, and it stops on a good commutator segment. So the next time I start it up, current can flow, I can spin, and then it stops on a good segment again, turn it on, starts to spin, stops on a bad segment. When it stops on that bad segment, the electricity can't get through the circuit. It's just an opener at that point. So it won't spin. Those are the intermittent no starts you fix with a hammer, right? You tap on the bottom of the gas tank a little bit. It vibrates, it vibrates. It spins around till it gets to a good contact and then it's able to spin. Now, one bad contact isn't going to really affect it too much once it's going because of the kinetic energy of it spinning. It's going to spin right past it pretty much. Maybe it might slow it down a little bit but I don't think it'd be too terribly noticeable. It's able to spin right past it. So that's why you wanna make sure there aren't any missing. Now we know on this pump, there's eight commutators. So if we count out eight bumps, that's one time around for the motor. So if we take this pattern, we put cursor one right here, that's number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then there's number one again, right? So that's one time around in between those cursors. Now you can do a calculation of the RPM of the pump by counting the number of revolutions in a 10 millisecond window. If you have a tool, snap-on tool with a guided component test that already does that for you too. So you don't really have to worry about that. Uh, but one revolution in 10 milliseconds equals 6,000 RPM because of math. 
So in this case, we see one and a half revolutions in the 10 millisecond window. So we said one time around was 6,000, right? And then a half a time around, that'll be another, that should be another 3,000. So that's 9,000 RPM, just eyeballing it real quick, should be pretty close to 9,000 RPM this pump is spinning. So let's do some math using the cursors. I know you never, th never thought you use math so much when it comes to diagnosing cars, but you use it more often than you might think. Uh, so we took those cursors and we used the delta time. So that's the distance between the two cursors. The delta in this case is 6.95 milliseconds. So one revolution of the pump means it takes 6.95 milliseconds to occur. Now there's 60,000 milliseconds in a minute. If we take 60,000 and divide it by how long it takes to turn one time, we get our revolutions per minute of the pump. In this case, 60,000 divided by 6.95 gives us 8,633 RPM. So that is really close to that 9,000 we looked at on the previous screen, it's within 5%. Now a healthy fuel pump on a brushed fuel pump will operate five to 6,000 RPM or more. When you get down to under 3,000 or so, you're gonna have a drivability problem. Why might you have a drivability problem? Because the volume of fuel won't be getting to the front of the car as fast as it needs to. The volume of fuel is controlled by the speed of the pump. The pressure is controlled by the pressure regulator. All right, so we have uh, those two different things. You could have a drivability problem and add idle, man, this thing puts out perfect pressure, it's perfect. But under a load, I don't have enough fuel getting there fast enough because the pump's not spinning fast enough. We need that pint in 30 seconds to get that uh, going. So it could be at part throttle at idle. It's fine. But when you hammer down, really need that fuel to be getting up there, doesn't happen. Uh, so in that case, if you suspect that, it'd be pretty easy to check with a current probe to be able to check that fuel pump. All right, so that's brushed fuel pump operation and testing. How about control methods? How do we control these fuel pumps? Because that's a, that's a, those kind of go hand in hand, right? So basic relay control. This is the, the was kind of the original. It's been around for a long time. We have a relay and we have uh, the computer controls the ground on the, re on the coil of the relay. So when the computer turns on the relay, it sends voltage down to the motor and the motor has power and ground. So it's either spinning or it's not spinning. As long as that relay is working, it'll turn it on, turn it off. So uh, the relay supplied battery positive via the fuse and then ECM grounds the coil. The pump runs continuously. It's not variable in any way. It's just on or off. It's either spinning or it's not. Then we get a little bit more advanced and we can get a relay and a controller. So this is like, uh, this is the setup from the car we were just looking at that uh, current ramp uh, pattern from. So the relay is supplied battery positive once again. ECM grounds the relay coil to control it. Then the relay feeds the control module. The control module then has a positive and a negative that go to the motor, it can turn it uh, and it can control the speed. It has two wires that go to the computer and then it has the power that comes from the relay and then the ground. So if I was gonna test this, we can test power ground, we can test whether or not the, the signal's getting to the fuel pump as well. And then we can see whether or not we're getting signals from the computer. And then we get into brushless fuel pump control. So this is a completely different animal than what we're used to if you're used to testing brushed fuel pumps. Brushless fuel pumps haven't been that common been a few years at least probably five six years they've been showing up on cars but they haven't been all that popular uh, i've noticed and i'm not really sure the correlation but i've noticed an awful lot of direct injected vehicles use brushless fuel pumps not all of them but a lot of them do so on a brushless fuel pump uh, you have an actual ecu that controls the fuel pump you have a ground you have um power, battery power, and then you have fuel pump control from the computer. So that sends a data signal to this control module to tell it what to do. The pump over here, you can see it's four wires. I have ground, and then it's a three phase control. So I have what they call the V, the U, and the W. So it's three different phases, 120 degrees offset. And we're gonna talk more about this in a couple seconds. Uh, but the control module modulates the RPM of that pump, and that's how, what allows it to spin there. So let's talk about this brushless fuel pump. If you're familiar or not familiar, if you're not familiar with how this uh, brushless fuel pump works, kind of like the opposite of what we were looking at on the brush pump. So on the brush pump, remember the magnets were stationary and the coils moved. In this case, the coils are stationary and the magnet moves. So we have permanent magnets around the center on the rotor, like here. And then we see we have matched coils. So there's three sets of coils. Uh, on here. So we have uh, the A, B, and C. 
UVW, if you will. And they repel this magnet as it goes around. Now, not, it's not always just one magnet. It could be multiple magnets. So as we, if we watch just one of these, right, this one's off. And then as it swings by, that turns to a south pole, and there's a south pole there, so it repels. And then once it's passed, it turns off. And then you'll notice this one again goes to a north pole. And then it repels and so on and so forth. So it's able to repel in 120 degrees or so each of these permanent magnets, turning on and off rapidly. So they can be a positive or a negative. So they can be polarized. They can go either direction. Uh, so when I'm looking at voltage on this, I will see a voltage that starts going up and I'll see another voltage that starts going down. When we look at amperage, the amperage goes positive. The amperage goes negative. Right? We'll go a little bit more in detail on an actual pattern on a pump when we go live on the tool in a few minutes, but I just want you to know it's, it's completely different. I will show you the pattern in a second and, and you'll see it's, it's, it's not like anything we've really seen before. So there's that control module that was out of that 2018. So it had a Camry with a 2.5 liter engine has that. And it has that F, uh, D4S type engine in there too, where it has the low pressure injectors and the high pressure injectors. And it all gets fed by this brushless pump. And here's what it looks like on a scope if you were to test that pump. So here's my three phases, 120 degrees apart. You'll see there's positive and negative, and then there's also positive amperage and negative amperage there as well. So there's a lot to look at. And I said, we'll go a little bit more in detail towards the end of the class on that one. Then we'll talk about the high pressure fuel pump. So once we have the low pressure out of the tank, gets to the, gets to the engine, we have a high pressure fuel pump. There's a few different systems that are out there, but by and large, they're all mechanical. And it runs off the camshaft. All, every manufacturer is a little bit different, but pretty much that's, that's the system they use. Not a lot of electrical testing on these. It's really a resistance test on this valve right here that's got two wires. But it runs, it's got a roller rocker, and it pushes up on a, on a spring here inside that uh, pump. So as we see, it runs off an eccentric on the end of the camshaft, so it's like a rounded square almost. So when the square is flat, uh, it is uh, not pushing. And when we're on the rounded corner of the square, it's pushing. So it goes up and down multiple times every time it, it uh, goes by. So it's, it's pumping fairly fast, depending on how fast the engine's going. And it pushes on a diaphragm and it pumps the, uh, increases the pressure coming out the backside. Uh, so as I said, the only thing we can test electrically here is the spill valve. And that's really just a, a resistance test to make sure the valve has continuity and all that. Otherwise, it's a mechanical problem. Uh, it can either be a problem with the camshaft, could be a problem with the lifter. Could be a problem with the spring right here or something internal inside the pump this is delphi one lots of manufacturers use this one uh, so just be aware that that could be uh, a problem there. now let's talk fuel injectors right so after it leaves the high pressure pump it goes to the fuel injector so at the fuel injector on the left hand side we have our standard run-of-the-mill multi-port gasoline injector low pressure injector uh, feeds in the top i got a pintle i got a seat i got a coil and I got a spring in here and it just kind of goes up and down. It's a solenoid, right? It opens and closes. On the right-hand side is one of our two types of GDI injectors we have. And we'll see it's very similar to our standard top feed injector. It just has a much longer neck. Now, why does it have the longer neck? Because it needs to get into the cylinder. It's not just injecting into the uh, intake. But it does have a pintle and a seat and a spring and a coil. But it runs on a much higher voltage and it runs on a different type of strategy when it comes to open and close. So here would be a standard injector. Here's what we would see. Yellow is voltage, green is amperage, and then blue is fuel pressure. So in this case, we see the voltage comes in, PCM grounds it, leaves it on, that's the whole time it's on. And then when it's off, when it shuts off, we see a little spike because the coil is dissipating its energy. And then we see that little bump right there where the pintle closes. On the amperage, we see the amperage build and this little dip right here indicates where the injector opens. So it's about open for about half of that distance. And uh, we see how it kind of levels off right there. So that is a, that's a known good, fairly standard pattern on a uh, multi-port fuel injector. Now, if we were to compare that to this other direct injector, you can see it's completely different. On the direct injector, it has a plus and a minus, and it also does have the amperage. You'll see on the positive side, my voltage gets up to about a little over 60 volts to open it for the initial opening event. Then once it's done that, it goes down for a bit. We lose some voltage, goes down to about 10 volts in this case. And then you see it pulse width modulates the signal the rest of the time until it's time to close. 
On my negative side, you can see how it kind of reflects the voltage, but it's not much. It goes from zero volts to a little over half a volt at the peak. Comes down, dips down a little bit. We see the pulse of modulation mirror, and then we see a spike at the end. That's where the injector closes on that green side, that negative side. We can see that reflected there. And then we also see the amperage go up considerably at the beginning, then it drops and holds, and then it drops and holds. So that, that is a uh, amperage pattern off of that type of injector. So that's this is still your solenoid type, pintle type injector, but just the way they spray it and the way they operate it, it's more of a uh, peak and hold type injector when they're doing that. Now you may also notice, and we're gonna read up a little more on this in, in a bit, but you may also notice on some of these vehicles, they'll feed banks at the same time and then they'll just turn on individual injectors. So you may see events like this, and I'll show you one in a second, or in a few minutes anyways, uh, it kind of looks like this, but it doesn't have the amperage to go with it. It's like in every other one, because it's on four cylinder. So it's in every other one. So when the amperage goes up, that's how we know it opens. When the amperage doesn't go up, that means the other injector opened. And we're just seeing a reflection in the, uh, in the wiring, in the, in the voltage. So that's my, uh, I guess, top feed, fairly standard solenoid type injector. Then we also have these piezoelectric injectors. Piezoelectric injectors work a bit differently. They still have a pintle and valve and seat in there, uh, but they have this piezoelectric uh, actuator up here. So what a piezoelectric stack is, it's a bunch of ceramic discs and they're stacked up inside a casing and they can do one of two things. They, you actually use these on a car in both ways. If they move or vibrate, they will generate a voltage. If they have voltage applied to them, they will move. So it works in both directions. If you think about how a knock sensor works, knock sensor is a small piezo stack that vibrates. When it vibrates, it generates a voltage, goes to the computer, that's how we know we have knock. When we supply voltage to this stack, it expands and that's what allows that injector to open. And it opens very rapidly, very, very rapidly. It can open and close multiple times in a spray cycle. Now, when the electricity is applied to the stack cuts off, the spring closes the pintle. So it has a high, high pressure spring in there that allows that pintle to close. And these atomize the fuel very, very finely. Usually these are found in the ones that are right next to the spark plug in many cases, because uh, it's able to finely atomize and direct that fuel where it needs to go. So to control it, there's six injectors right there. I just, it's a two wire thing. Power, all of them share pretty much the same power source and that it's controlled by the computer. On the other end, we have a signal and a signal. So we have power source and we have a, a control signal. That's all it is. So if we look inside guided component test, it's gonna tell us a little bit about how it works. So the power supply that a piezoelectric injector is from the DME or PCM, whichever you wanna call it. PCM supplies high voltage to piezoelectric injectors of about 140 volts and also controls the ground side of these direct injectors. The computer supplies voltage to bank one, injectors one through three, and then controls the ground side of that specific injector. The same is true for bank two. The voltage on the ground side is influenced by a supply voltage. This is why you'll see two high voltage waveforms, which look like the power of the injectors, and then low voltage only once when the injector is turned on. So similar to what I was talking about before. The injector is only turned on when the voltage is pulled low, the other high voltage is pulsed on the control side should be ignored as they do not affect the injector operation. When voltage is applied across the piezoelectric element, the piezoelectric element is squeezed, thus causing the element to expand, pushing the injector pintle off its seat. The injector will continue to inject fuel until the current reverses and pull the injector back to its seat and the fuel injection is forced closed. So when you're looking at amperage on this, you'll see a positive amperage and then a negative amperage. PCM uses sensor and puts a calculated injector on time. On time at idle on a fully warmed up engine is typically around 675 to 975 microseconds. That's less than a millisecond for time, down to maybe almost a little more than half a millisecond. That's 675 millionths of a second. At snap, the injector on time increases to about one and a half milliseconds or more. At hard snap or acceleration, there may be double injector pulse, the first one around 500 microseconds and the longer one at one and a half milliseconds. Also, when driving under heavy load, the piezoelectric injectors may even enter a multi-striking mode where it will turn the injector on several times in one cycle. It can open and close that injector multiple times every time that injector fires. So they're crazy fast. They can react very, very quickly to changes in vehicle conditions. Help us with the response. 
We were going to go do a test on this. We want to look at the warning first, though. Voltage supplied up to 140 volts at 10 amps and can peak up to 220 volts. Do not make contact with the fuel injector harness, ECM, or fuel injectors while the ignition is on or run position. They also recommend to use insulated gloves. They also recommend to wait about five minutes after the key is turned off to allow the capacitors to bleed off because that's how they're able to build up that voltage. They use high voltage capacitors in there. It allows it to uh, have that throughout the system. So yeah, be careful. High voltage, high pressure. We want to look at a couple example signatures. So my yellow is my power side and my green is the control side. So you can see when it opens, they, they match up there and then the power kind of went off the screen there a little bit, but we can see the control opens it and then it holds steady and then it drops to close it. We enter multi-strike, open, close, open, close, open, close. And this is not a whole lot of amount of time right there. It's a very short amount of time as they said. So it'll open and close. And then if we were to look at amperage, we would see this. So we see a positive amperage, level off, negative amperage. So you will see a negative amperage in that case. All right, so that's our injectors. So now let's take a look at a couple of the actual real world live patterns here. So we'll pull up a couple vehicles here. So let's first look at the fuel pump. There we go. separate these out there we go that's what i was looking for okay so let's tag a beginning here a little bit just want to see it start at the beginning here okay so we have so in this case we have three channel four channel setup so this is voltage voltage, voltage, amperage. So this is uh, UV and W is like we said, there's three phases on there and you're gonna see a positive and a negative. So I pull up some cursors and we'll take a look at one revolution of this fuel pump. So it starts there and it ends right there. So that's one time around the fuel pump because we have our positive and our negative. So you see how it goes, uh, it starts down and then it pulses and pulses and pulses and that ends down and then it starts up pulses, 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 ends up, and then it starts over again. So that is one time with the positive, one time with the negative. As we said, we have those opposing uh, voltages, opposes, opposing amperages. Here is my current ramp pattern with this. So we can see, and, and the current ramp was around this number one channel. So we can see how it bumps up and down uh, when these, when everything is on at the same time, we see the current draw. And when the second one turns off, we see the current bumps up a little bit uh, for a while until this one turns back on again. And then we see a little, another little spike in the amperage and it kind of levels off. And then when number one turns off, it goes back down to zero. Then when number one turns on again, it goes down when they're all on. And then when there are a couple of them wrong, we have it here, we have another spike. So we can see how the amperage changes and fluctuates a little bit depending on which of these coils is on. All three of them can be on at any given time. Usually it's an opposite though. So we'll see a, a down and up, a down and up, a down and, and, and an up, right? So we'll see them opposite of each other as that motor is spinning around. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. It was a little different type of pattern than we're normally used to those sorts of things. Um, so if you're testing a brushless motor, it's not nearly as easy as testing a brush motor. Uh, we can still get the information out of it. We can actually do a fuel pump calculation we can calculate the rpm on this as well by doing the same exact thing so if we do one complete revolution of that pump and then we see uh, our delta time of 12.64 milliseconds so i'm going to take my little math i'm going to 60,000 divided by 12.64 spinning at 4746 rpm so that's actually a little low this was at idle so that's that's a little bit lower than you would expect with a brushed fuel pump as well. So just be aware of that, right? So it's not necessarily that 5,000, it's close to 5,000, uh, but it doesn't need to spin as fast at an idle in order to keep up. Right? So that is the fuel pump. Let's look at the injector. Plus minus an M. So this is on a Subaru. 
cross track. Uh, so you see, we have the positive, the negative, and the amperage. So I'm going to actually bring those back to. There we go. So you can overlay each other. So there's my positive, there's my negative, and then there is my amperage. So you can see that that one fired. If I zoom out a little bit, though, whoops, not that far. So if I zoom in on this one, we'll see that we don't have an amperage event. And we'll also see that the voltage on the negative side got much higher on this case, two and a half volts, instead of the half a volt that we were on the firing event. So we see the volt that the amperage doesn't flow. That means that injector did not fire that time. It was its sister injector on the other side. So as I said, it'll feed both banks. This one only has two injectors on a bank. Uh, so we can see every other, it looks like every other one uh, has that amperage event. So we can see we get up a little over 65 volts there. And we see that up and down reflection, but we don't see the big spike at the end of the negative, And we don't see the amperage. So that means that injector did not open that time because it wasn't meant to open at that time. Uh, let's flip over and pick a different one. You can kind of see it if you look. Actually, I might be able to show it this way. There we go. So yeah, you can see how we have the negatives are smaller when it opens. Uh, and then the positives, we, we don't have an opening here. It's in every other event where it opens, right? So it's, it's two injectors on the same bank being fed at the same time. So I have one, op one time it opens, one time it doesn't. And we can see that reflected in the way the pattern is. It's in every other one. So that's just a little bit different as well with the fuel injector. So once I have kind of a, a, a decent baseline as to what I'm looking for, we can augment that with those guided component tests I talk about as well. Uh, so if we go in here, there are built-in classes inside the tool. So if you have a snap-on scope with the guided component test, you do have this how-to section in here under classes. Here's your basic electric component classes, brushless motor class right in there. Learn a little bit more about those brush brushless fuel systems. Uh, fuel filter testing. Let's see. There's got to be some more in here. Electric windows, forced induction, mechanical theory. Drive control, NOx accumulators, pressure transducers, SCR systems, uh, waveform class, common rail diesel injection. There is a gasoline direct injection class in here, and I'm just not seeing it for the moment. But there is gasoline direct injection in here as well. Uh, so if you want to learn more about any of those topics, it's built in right inside the tool. Alternatively, we can also look up a vehicle. So in this case, I want to look up uh, this Mercedes here. So it's a 2017 Mercedes C-Class. It's my buddy Al's wife's car. So we go in, in the guided component test function of the tool. Um, there's over 5 million tests, goes back to 1981. There's a wealth of information in here. You see, it covers more than just the engine. It covers transmission, starting, HVAC, et cetera. In this case, I want to go into engine though, and I want to check the fuel system. Once I'm in the system, I can see all the other components I can test. I want to test the fuel system, and then we'll go to the fuel injector. This should have that piezoelectric injector, and yes, it does, there it is. Uh, so this is gonna be the same information we got from that BMW in the presentation. Do you see how we have the control signal and supply for each injector? It's gonna tell you where it's located. So the best test location is actually at the two pin con connector of each fuel injector or at the ECM, if it's easier. The direct injectors are located in the center of the cylinder head next to the spark plug for that cylinder and are attached to the fuel rail. So those are right in the middle. That, is, that should be that stratified charge that we're using. The injector tip is fragile. Follow manufacturer procedures for installing back into the combustion chamber. Do not allow any dirt to enter the injection system. That makes sense as well. So I have my connector views here for each injector. If I back up, we can do a resistance test. Let's look at the resistance on this because this is kind of interesting as well. So as we said, voltage 140, amp, uh, 140 volts at 10 amps can peak up to 220 volts. Uh, wear the fancy gloves, don't get shocked. And uh, let's see, typical resistance on a cool engine is 400,000 to 600,000 ohms. On a fully warm up engine after a hot soak, typical resistance can be as low as 150,000 to 200,000 ohms. Because the resistance of piezoelectric crystal is not always stable, you may need to leave the ohm meter connected longer to get a correct stable reading. So all these different things make it a little bit more, a little bit different when we go to check, test it, but we can still test it because we have all the information we need right here. And then if we do a signature test, that's gonna show us those signatures that we had before. 
you'll hook up to the signal. You see the positive and the negative. There's multi-strike. There's your amperage right there. Now all I have to do is hit view meter. I'm not hooked up to anything, so we won't see anything. But we would be able to see. Let me bring it back to where I was too, because that affects it. We'd be able to see that signal on the screen. I can put my known good up on the screen. It automatically sets the voltage where it needs to be, automatically sets the time where it needs to be. So really, I just got to hook up to that injector where it tells me, and it should catch a pattern on the screen, makes it a lot easier to test a lot faster. So once I've gone through, if I suspect I had a problem, I tested the injector. In fact, the injector is bad, so I need to replace it. That's good. So we can replace it. When we replace it, we want to test the new one for one thing to make sure that it still works. You ever gotten a brand new part in a box that didn't work? does happen. So we want to make sure we test the new part. And then after the fact, on a lot of these cars as well, we have a scanner function that we need to do as well. So I'm going to pop over to my scanner really quick through my simulator, load this vehicle. And we have a reset for this for the injectors. Uh, so you could go into service resets and relearns if you have that on your tool. It is a quick link to, be, uh, to allow you to add any of the uh, 51 resets or relearns on this Mercedes. Uh, in this case, I'm just gonna go into engine though. And it is a functional test under the engine system. And that should be an adaptation right there. Injector injection quantity adjustment is what they call it. You can activate the fuel pump that way as well. Correction programming, the fuel economy, et cetera. But we wanna do an injector quantity adjustment because when you replace an injector, you need to change the injector quantity adjustment. So make sure key is on, engine is off. Replacing the injector is essential to save the QR code of the new injector in the engine control unit. This process ensures that the necessary correction parameters for the injector will be recorded in the engine control unit. These correction parameters enable the engine control unit to meter the injection quantity precisely. We go in here, QR code of the injector consists of a five character number, the number is located on the body of the injector. So make sure you check it before you install. It'll come to this test, it's a four cylinder vehicle and it'll just show you which injector code is in there right now in each cylinder. So let's say I replaced injector number one. I'll hit edit. I go in here, one, two, three, four, five, hit okay. Here's the old ID, there's the new ID, are you sure? Hit program, done. Programs it into the PCM and it's ready to go. There it shows you all of your uh, current codes in the injector as well. So it's not just Mercedes that does this, it's just a good example that I was able to find. I know BMW has this as well. Uh, diesels for sure, we're not really talking about diesel injection, but diesels, any diesel, Pretty much any of those injectors need coating as well. So a lot of these direct injectors do need coating. Um, so it is in there and it's available for your use. So with that, that's pretty much my time. So let's go over and just give you a couple more little tidbits before I get the questions. So thank you for joining me here. I just want to say that I do train every week on Tuesdays, uh, twice on Tuesdays. So uh, 6 and 9 Eastern time, if you want to go to snapon.com slash OT, you can sign up to join on Zoom like you are right now. Uh, session one also streams directly to YouTube at the same time. So if you prefer using YouTube, go to youtube.com slash snapon diagnostics. Make sure you subscribe, hit the notification button, and you'll be able to watch those as well. And then session two, 9 Eastern, stream live to my Facebook. So that's facebook.com slash snapon Jason, all one word, no dash, snapon Jason. Uh, so just look me up. You can follow me there. And you can watch me streaming there if you want as well. So this is industry topic type training. They're about half an hour blocks, similar to what we did tonight. This is like a, pretty much an extended version of what we would do in one of those sessions on a Tuesday night. So definitely worth your time, I think. I, I don't know about you, but I definitely think it's worth your time to be always learning, right? And we are up to 28 episodes currently of past uh, topics as well. So we had ADOS, data bus testing, uh, module set up and a bunch of component testing we've been doing over the summer talking about individual components. So once again, those are also archived on YouTube as well for your viewing pleasure. So if you want to go check that out, youtube.com slash snap on diagnostics. All right, let's get to Q&A here. See what we have for some questions. I see we have some of my window keeps popping up on the wrong screen. All right, Joseph says you just thought we were talking about the problems with the uh, injection system. So the so BRZ did it right, Subaru BRZ, with the direct import injection. Well, guess where they got that from, though, was Toyota, right? Because the BRZ is a Toyota Subaru kind of mashup, right? 
So definitely a good point there, Joseph. The BRZ, it is kind of an outlier, but yeah, they use that same type of system there as well. Uh, I do see a couple of hands popped up. I can't answer you if your hand is up. I, 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 you'll need to put your question in the Q&A box. So just so you know, just hit the Q&A button, type in your question there. Uh, let's see. Anonymous attendee, if the pump impeller is worn, would the RPM not go up? If the pump spins so f- spins too fast, would that also be a problem? The pump is not moving fuel. Uh, the pump will vary speed based on load. So if I have less fuel in the tank, it'll actually spin faster, and it could draw more amperage as well with that. Um, if the impeller is worn, suppose the RPM could go up, depending on the clearances in there. It won't have as much resistance in the impeller. So I suppose in that case, the, the uh, could go up. The uh, amperage could also go up in that case as well. Uh, let's see. Got Martin. Uh, is fuel pump controller pulse width modulated or resistor? It depends on the system. In that case, the one we were talking about was pulse width modulated in that case. Um, I think there's a couple out there that may have a resistor in there, but I know that one we were definitely looking at was pulse width modulated there, Martin. All right, let's see. Anonymous attendee asks, does this tool allow different time parameters for each channel? No, it does not. And I get asked that question a lot. And I just think of it this way. When you're using a scope, you want to be able to compare multiple things happening at the same time. So if I'm looking at different time scales, that can skew where that thing that I'm looking at is going to fall. So for example, when we were looking at the amperage, the voltage, and the pressure on that regular fuel injector, if I had a different time on my pressure and I had a different time on my voltage and I had a different time on my amperage, none of that would line up. So I wouldn't be able to compare it in time with each other. That's one of the powerful things that you can do with a scope, especially when you're doing multi-channel diagnostics is being able to see it all at the same time. So we don't allow varying time for that reason because it kind of defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do. I know some other manufacturers out there do that. I haven't seen a use case for it in automotive anyways. I'm sure maybe out in the electronics world, there might be a use case for it. But in the automotive world, we're trying to get everything together and check it time-wise with each other. I don't, I don't know where we'd use that. Uh, let's see, can I expand on ground side control of the fuel injector? So in the limited amount of time that I have, um, the PCM on the, on, the, on the standard injector, the PCM uses the uh, injector driver inside the injector to ground or inside the module to ground it. Uh, so instead of doing that, it, it does a, a positive voltage and a negative voltage to open and close the higher capacity injectors, the higher voltage injectors. Uh, so it really doesn't necessarily control the ground side. It's more of an open and a close in that point at, at that point uh, coming out of the injector there. Thank you, Sadar. Uh, let's see, Ryan asks, are those classes on the MODIS? Absolutely they are. Depending on where your update is, um, with the latest update on a MODIS Ultra or a MODIS Edge, you'd have that classes button right at the top of guided component test. If you're at least one update back, so the spring, I uh, would be at the bottom of the list, it says training in classes. And then if it's a couple of years old, there uh, is a little head icon on the top right-hand corner of the screen with three circles inside it. If you see that, click on that, that'll get you there on the MODIS as well. Older MODIS, I don't remember where they are, but they're in there too. I think it's in one of the toolboxes. I, I get, my memory doesn't always go back that far. Uh, but if it's a MODIS Ultra, any of the touchscreen MODISes, that's how you would get to those. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see. Should the current flow for each phase be the same on the, uh, the, the brush list? Yes. Uh, as long as everything's working the way it should, it should be the same amount of current flow through there because uh, the resistance shouldn't be any different. And the voltage applied shouldn't be any different. Uh, I, was, I only have one amp probe, so I was only able to check one at a time, but you can see how they kind of fluctuate with each other. All right. And then we have uh, some thank yous. Robbie, thank you very much. Rob Emig. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, always glad to see you in class there. Uh, I, I, hate but, I hate butchering names, so I'm just going to say Mr. Herrera. Thank you very much uh, for thanking me. Uh, thank you for attending very much. Uh, Mike Rowe, thank you very much. Glad you enjoyed the class. Former 16-year Subaru Master Technician, so I feel your pain, right? We know, we know where we were at. Uh, I, I was in the... Uh, I started early 2000s till about 2011. So that 
era of the head gasket on the single cams, man. That, that was, I feel your pain. Alex Parada, how much does a Zeus cost? We'll have to get you in contact with a rep because I'm not allowed to say it, say how much it is because depending on what the different financing deals are, any rebates or anything like that, that might be out there, trade in values, any of that, I can't really give you an accurate number. You'd have to talk to your rep to see that. Uh, let's see. Martin asks, are U.S. vehicles stratified or homogeneous? It depends on the, how the manufacturer decided to have it because um, it, it, it depends. So that, that uh, the EcoBoost would be homogeneous, the one that I showed earlier where it sprays into the piston. Uh, that was homogeneous. The BMW and the Mercedes where they spray at the top, that's stratified. Also, I didn't – there's a tech note in there somewhere. I, I didn't see it tonight, but there is a tech note in there on the Mercedes and the BMW, the injectors that they use, if there's a failure in the pressure system, the pressure goes too low, they actually go from a stratified charge to a homogeneous charge. So they'll actually do both depending on the conditions of the engine. So if they lose high pressure, they can still operate, just not as well. So good question there, Mark. Christopher, thanks for the props. Appreciate you attending. Thank you very much. Harley, let's see. Looking forward to getting the, uh, the, the presentation tomorrow. We're not doing a handout, but you will get a link to the recording of this presentation tomorrow as well. Uh, Jacob asks, what's an ideal RPM for a fuel pump? General rule of thumb, uh, looking at about five to 6,000 RPM or more, because as we said earlier, it can vary depending on how much fuel's in the tank. And general rule of thumb, if I see more than 5,000 RPM or roughly 5,000 RPM or more, I'm in good shape. If I get down to 3,000 or less, that's where you're going to run into the problem. So that's a good rule of thumb to follow. Tom, less load, less amperage. Yes, because it's not pushing as hard. Less load equals less amperage. Let's see. William has half a question here. So can I trust scan data on GDI fuel system info on a scanner for, uh, I'm not sure, but as far as when scanner data is concerned, you can trust it as well as you can trust the computer. So the computer is giving the scanner its interpretation of its data. So I would say by and large, yes, you should be able to trust it as long as there isn't a problem in the computer and it's miscalculating. Uh, so other than that, you should be able to trust the, the data that's in the scanner because uh, that's the computer telling you, here's what, here's the decisions that I'm making based on the inputs that I see. Let's see, John said, let's see. John's got some good extra tips to expand upon our RPM and amperage checks. So you need to look at amperage and RPM for sure. Uh, high amperage and low RPM is generally restriction. Low amperage and low RPM is generally an electrical issue. High RPM and low amperage is a pump not doing work, no impeller, no fuel, et cetera. So very good. Add that extra color there. Definitely appreciate that, John. Thanks for that. Uh, Anonymous asks, what about oil catch cans? Yes, I was actually thinking about that as I was talking. Because I used to deal with the, the performance Subaru side of things as well. So oil catch cans are definitely necessary in that world. So, yeah, that would help with the carbon buildup, at least from that aspect. Um, you still might get a little bit in there from other sources, but by and large, that, that should help cut it down a lot. Absolutely. Uh, normal amp draw on a good pump versus a bad pump. It's going to depend. Like we just had on that last, uh, that, that last comment there was uh, it's going to depend on how much fuel is in the pump or how much fuel's in the tank, how fast the pump is spinning, uh, the type of electrical condition the pump is in. Um, I'd say I've seen anywhere from, well, it depends, it depends on how well your amp probe's calibrated. Uh, so I've seen anywhere from a couple amps up to eight, nine, 10 amps. It depends on, uh, on how it's running. You just gotta also think of the 15 amp circuit. Uh, you don't wanna run more than generally, you know, more than half of that, uh, generally speaking. Let's see, uh, Anonymous says both power and ground are controlled on GDI electro hydraulic. Yes, so power and ground are both controlled or the positive and the negative, both controlled by the controller. Uh, let's see, can you see pinto movement and a current voltage waveform on direct injector? Not that I've been able to see. You may be able to if you can get a little bit more detail on the pattern. Personally, not what I've been able to see. Uh, the pinto movement. You can see that it is opening because it's drawing that amperage. And then on that closed side, you do see that little dip at the end as well. Uh, let's see. Kevin asks, how do you or can you check the high pressure PSI on a vehicle? You can, but you got to be really careful about it. <laughs> that's, that's how you would want to do it. 
Uh, so you want to make sure you remove the pressure from the system. Uh, so check with your manufacturer information as to how to safely do that because there's different methods depending on a manufacturer. So you want to make sure you relieve the pressure first before you put your pressure testing implement in there. Now, uh, as far as snap-on is concerned, if you wanted to use a pressure transducer, uh, we do have a pressure transducer that goes up to 5,000 PSI. So that would work with that as long as it doesn't go over 5,000 PSI and be able to read that. You just have to find somewhere to tap in on the high pressure, high pressure line with the appropriate adapters. Make sure they're tight, make sure they're sealed, make sure you don't have any fuel spraying out. It's kind of a tough situation because it is dangerous, right? You wanna be very, very careful when it comes to that because high pressure fluids can cut. You ever seen a, uh, a water, they call it the water jet, right? Cuts out metal using high pressure water. So think about what high pressure fuel could do. We don't wanna, we don't wanna really mess around with that without being very, very careful. You don't just wanna kind of do it in your backyard there. So good question though, Kevin, thanks. Mike says 2004 to 2021 at Subaru. So definitely, hey, it's, it's, uh, it's always been an interesting time in that, in that amount of time that you were there, right? Uh, let's see, Mike talks about the reed valve that I talked about earlier. So it's just a little, uh, it's just like a little plastic, almost little, just a flap in there. It's just a flat piece that's attached on one side and it just kind of flaps in the breeze. As it does so, it just adds that little bit of restriction to the air and the oil in the air sticks to it and it falls back in. It's not the most elegant solution in the world. It's not all that technical of solution in the world. It's just kind of like, almost like a piece of floppy plastic that's in there and it just, it just kind of wipes off the air and lets it go down. Uh, do all GDI systems use high voltage injectors only? As far as I have seen, yes. Um, just be, cut, just be, able, be able to open it to overcome the pressure they need to be able to have that extra voltage to go in there. Let's see, why does the resistance to the injector go down when it heats up, Sean asks. Uh, that'd be due to the coils expanding and the resistance will lower when, the, uh, when it's warmer up because it's gonna expand, allows more electrons to flow through that. Donald, thank you very much. Glad you, glad you uh, enjoyed it. Uh, Martin says, I remember US was one way Euro vehicles the other, maybe back before, but like I said, we have those BMWs and Mercedes that do both. So um, it might not be more of like a, it might've been like a rule of thumb maybe before. Uh, Euro vehicles use a much larger catalytic converter. That could be, uh, I haven't really experienced European vehicles over there. Oh, here's a really good one. I like this question. I've had, I've had this question before. I like this question. Scott says, why do fuel pumps always fail right after the customer fills their tank? So if my tank is empty or really close to empty because we never fill our tank when it's three quarters full, right? So when the tank is almost empty, think of what cools off that pump. The fuel cools off the pump because it's sitting in the fuel, plus the fuel goes through it. But most of the cooling is by the outside of the pump. So if it's getting ready to fill, if it's getting ready, if there's anything in there that can't take a shock, like something in the windings or something like that, as soon as that cold fuel hits it, you're done. So that's why they always fail after it fills the tank. It almost seems like it's Murphy's Law, but there is actually a scientific explanation for it. It's the cold shock of the fuel on the hot pump, and it just can cause things to break. Very good question. Tom says, well, GDI pressures are going to 5,000 PSI to reduce particulate emissions. That's crazy, right? So we're seeing in the literature there, it goes up to like 3,000 PSI, 5,000 PSI. Now, I know diesels have already been there. Diesels have been to 5,000 for a while, but you know, we're talking GDI here. So yeah, definitely a good, good, good tip there. Uh, Walter, is the Lexus Toyota dual injector less prone to carbon buildup? I would say by design, that's why they designed it that way, yes. In practice in the real world, I'm not 100% sure. Like I said, I haven't torn one apart, but the math works. The, the, the thought process, the engineering behind it, I think works. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would say I would be less prone to carbon buildups. That's why they did it that way. Would more regulated fuel pressure give you more amps at the pump? If it's pushing harder, it would need to draw more to push harder. So I would say probably yes, probably yes. Doing my math equations in my head this late at night isn't always that easy. 
Uh, let's see. Scan tool, check high side pressure, no test port. Yes, you don't. There's definitely no test port. And like I said, it would be very dangerous to take it apart. Uh, so you would want to use a scan tool ideally to check the high side pressure. But if my pressure, my pressure sensor doesn't work, I don't know. We'd still need to test it, right? Hmm, let's see. Now we're getting to more math. <laughs> so let's see. Jurgen says, you're here with a rule of thumb, one amp per 10 PSI fuel pressure in low pressure systems. Uh, I've actually never heard that rule of thumb in there, but let's see. So if I'm at 45 PSI or so at an idle, uh, that would be four and a half amps. Yeah, that's probably about right. That sounds about right. Probably depends on how much fuel is in the tank too. Tom says high pressure right in the bloodstream. Very dangerous. Yeah. And by, by the time it gets to the bloodstream, it's not going to look very good for whatever it hits either there, Tom. So yeah, definitely very dangerous. You don't want to be messing around with it. Uh, anonymous asked, do most systems have a pressure sensor that displays on the scan tool for high pressure? Just check for bias, low pressure first. Yes, they do have a pressure sensor. They do have a high pressure sensor that feeds into the computer. And then you would be able to check that using scanner data there as well. Matt asks, is it possible for the sensor to read out of range and skew the ECM understanding? Absolutely. ECMs really like skewing things or they get skewed if they get wrong information from a sensor so it absolutely could i don't think it's nearly as common as it ever used to be because they've gotten better with logic and stuff but it absolutely can get skewed depending on what's going on uh richard marco mass is there is there true ways of cleaning the high pressure injectors i don't know of a way I suppose there might be a way to clean them on the car, but I would say probably the best bet would be injector shops probably have special tools to be able to do that on a bench. I would say being a, doing that on a bench is probably the easiest. Least, least easy way to break them for sure. So I would say you'd want to do that on a bench. There's probably, there's got to be a special machine for that. I've never seen it. Let's see, Mike gives us a little more color on the oil separator uh, cast in the block. It's a very small unit and not as good as separate AOS style. Basically a baffle like in a muffler. EJ motors were all in the back of the block and never chain variants are under the timing, uh, newer chain variants like I have are under the timing cover. Yeah, so it's like a baffle. I read the patent one time and they described it as like a reed valve. Maybe it's not really as, as fancy as even a reed valve. Uh, but yeah, it's basically like a baffle, right? So it wipes the oil out of the air as best they can. Let's see, Charles Palmer was the purpose of the valve on the side of the high pressure valve. I don't remember the name of it, but it had two wire connector on it. Two wire connector on a valve on the high pressure valve. Oh, on, on, the, on, the, on the pump, on the, on the pump. So that's, a, that's like basically a bleed valve, uh, controls the pressure and the flow through it, but it's kind of like a spool valve, it opens and closes. Uh, so really it's just like a stepper motor. So I, the only way you can really test it is uh, with resistance, just to make sure it's within the resistance spectrals. Uh, why do some manufacturers use piezoelectric versus non-piezoelectric? I'd imagine there's probably a multitude of reasons, and I bet you some of them have to do with money. Um, probably also depends on how they're using them in the system as well. So like the piezoelectric ones we looked at tonight, I believe those are Bosch, and those are the ones that go right next to this spark plug, and those are uh, used for that stratified charge injection right because as that the way the the, pit, the uh nozzle is set and aimed is how that works uh so probably a little bit of costs probably a little bit of how it's designed and engineered uh let's see alex says to snap on sell a gauge to check high pressure yes they absolutely do sell a gauge set uh to test those types of things as well but the pressure transducer will work with your scope uh matt wyland let's see best way to clean carbon from the valves that goes back to the, uh, I'm sure there's a specialized cleaning solution for that. Um, as you said, the tips of those valves are, are the no, carbon from the valves. I'm thinking the injector, Never mind. back up. So carbon from the valves. So there's a couple different ways. I mean, I, I think like MotorVac or mo something similar to like the MotorVac has a way to clean it. I know one of the shops uh, close to my house, they do almost like a blasting. They'll do like a walnut blasting to blast the carbon off the back that way as well. So you have to do it to kind of open it up and take it apart to do that. Um, but depending on how bad it is, you know, you're gonna have to do something. We used to do it wire brushes and stuff, but it's not that, it's not that, it's worse. 
than back in the back in the day when we were just cleaning up regular gummed up valves, right? So uh, I'd say there's, there's, there's got to be some special cleaners for that at this point. And let's see, spill valve should work on a duty cycle to control pressure bleed, bleed off. Yes, it does. So that's that spill valve we were talking about on that high pressure pump. Uh, yep, Charles. So yep, that is a that's a spool valve in there. That valve on, on the on the pressure pump is controlled by pulsive modulation, and uh, really the only way you can test it is resistance. And you can check the signal going to it too to make sure the signal gets there. Make sure you see a pulse with injector in there. Um, so yeah, that'll be uh, that'll be that valve on the high pressure pump for you. Uh, let's see. Anonymous says, uh, how are the injectors sealed to prevent loss of compression? So there are special seals that go on the end of them. They actually are special tools to remove the old seals and put new seals on there uh, in order to prevent that loss of compression. Yeah, and usually to take them out, you need a slide hammer, especially slide hammer to pull them out as well. So, And then Micro asks, uh, VW had a TSB for using zip ties to clean carbon from the valves. Very interesting to Google. I think I'll have to look that up see about using zip ties to clean carbon from valves. All right, thanks for the input there, Mike. And it looks like with that, we cleared the board on questions. We're a few minutes over, but thanks for those of you who hung around and, and, and stuck it out with us. Uh, just one more thing, I just wanna, do wanna mention, we do also have scan tool training available. My buddy Al does this Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. He does Apollo on Monday, Zeus on Wednesday, Thursday is Triton. The Apollo class is about an hour long, it's very, very thorough. And the Zeus and Triton class are an hour of scanner and an hour of scope as well. So that is definitely worth your time if you're interested in learning more about those types of tools. Um, that's definitely your place to go is to go check out my buddy Al, snapon.com slash OT. With that, thank you very much for taking the time to spend with me on this uh, Thursday night. At least it is on the East Coast. Depending on where you are, it could be day or it could be night. So thank you very much. Appreciate taking the time out of your day to come spend a little bit of time with us. With that, hopefully we'll see you next time. See you in one of our other classes as well. Have a good rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend.